Good morning. It's a cold Melbourne day and we're facing our own issues with COVID here in Melbourne today. Uh, but they pale to insignificance compared to India. We have, I think, 18 patients last time I checked across the whole of Australia. Uh, CMC alone has uh, 1,100 patients. Uh, that's the hospital that we're going to be talking to today. So I dare say we can learn a lot from India given their current experience with COVID. And it's great that we actually are learning along with um, CMC Valor, uh, the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences uh, is actually in, engaged in a trial called the ASCOT trial, looking at different treatments of COVID-19. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the, that we're meeting today on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people who might be listening or watching this podcast. Let me start by introducing our two close friends of the university and, and of mine. I'd like to introduce um, Dr. John Peter or JVP or Dr. Peter from uh, Christian Medical College for Law. Melbourne has had a long association with CMC for Law. I think it's about 80 years, probably looking back since we first had that uh, staff going across to CMC. And we currently have a memorandum of understanding in place and a clinician researcher program, which we've been developing and Jane has led, um, the Dean of the Faculty has led over the last couple of years. So CMC is one of the leading medical colleges in India. Um, I lose count of how many beds you've got, JVP, is it around 3,000? About 3,000 now. 3,000. And JVP is the director of CMC for Law, but he's also an ICU consultant. So I can't imagine trying to do both of those jobs in the current crisis. So he's been back in the ICU uh, looking after COVID patients, but also at the same time directing a, a massive hospital. And I'd like to welcome Jubin as well. She's with Emmanuel Hospital Association, which is the largest charitable hospital network in North India. And likewise, I've been a Melbourne University partner, largely with the Nossal Institute for Global Health for the last um, 20 years. BHA has 19 hospitals at last count and about 40 community health and disability programs. Uh, Jubin is attached to the Herbapur Hospital in North India, and that's been a COVID hotspot in the state of Uttarakhand. So she's also been a System Mary Glary Scholar, a University of Melbourne program we have to help train um, students and health people, health staff in India. And she's been to Melbourne Uni, I think, uh, maybe three times. Uh, she's also a close friend and um, she's been working the front line at the Herbapur Hospital for the last uh, month as a clinical psychologist. And I think after this, she's got to don the PPE and go back into the ward for an eight hour shift in a 38 degree Ward. So that's going to be that's exhausting. So look at my hand over to Jane uh, to chair the session for us. Professor Jane Gunn is the Dean of the Medical Dentist, the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences. Uh, she's an accomplished scholar, clinical researcher and seasoned leader. And she's also been to CMC Valor and uh, India in 2019, I believe. Um, which I'm sure Jane will also talk a bit about too. So over to you, Jane. Look, thanks so much, Nathan. Um, it's really uh, exciting to be here with everyone um, today. As, but of course, it's such a difficult time in our history. I would not have expected when visiting CMC Valor in 2019 with, with Nathan that we would be in this situation that we are in facing with this um, you know, pandemic, um, which is affecting India, as we know, uh, very dramatically. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the country on which I'm, I'm speaking from and uh, the Kulin Nations, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also realise and recognise that, that those peoples also have uh, faced um, pandemics throughout um, the history of, of the development of Australia, which is um, something that is, makes us pause. I, um, over recent weeks, uh, the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences and my colleagues within the wider university have really been asking questions about um, our colleagues and, and the communities in India. And obviously we are, you know, uh, very, um, very delighted to have deep and enduring relationships and with both, both the organisations that are represented here today, both with JVP and, and Jubin and CMC Law um, and Emmanuel Hospitals. And it is, I think, often um, really important for us to understand um, and share stories across, those, um, across the countries because we can learn a lot. And I know our Health Leaders Programme, as Nathan has mentioned, really has given that opportunity for deep sharing and it's really 
uh, uh, something we want to continue with. And the, the Sister Mary Glowry Scholars Program really gives us that opportunity for exchange and learning from each other. So I'm just looking forward to hearing today about what everyone is, is facing and, and how we might share those experiences. So I know that both JVP and Jubin, you've been working on the front line, ICU and psychology. There's such, you know, demanding areas of, of practice. So perhaps just to begin, JVP, you might want to share with us, um, you know, what's it been like for you working in that ICU environment at such a challenging time? First of all, thank you so much for asking me to be part of this uh, uh, podcast. Uh, to me, it has been an extremely humbling experience to be in the front line, along with my co-workers trying to battle COVID. Uh, in the intensive care unit, uh, I found that uh, it was good to get back into a clinical role, trying to understand the disease and how different it is from the other causes of ARDS that we are so familiar with. But even more humbling was the experience of interacting with grassroots level workers and getting a sense of what the challenges are. Because as an administrator, unless you get down to the grassroots level and know what the challenges are, you're not able to do justice to macro planning at the administrative level. At the administrative level also, it has been very challenging because there was initially a lot of hesitancy amongst medical faculty and nursing faculty to come to the forefront and work. Because if you remember one year back, we knew little about the disease. There was a lot of fear and apprehension. And so several senior faculty went into the thick of things, particularly intensivists, and said, we will lead. And then others followed. So the initial challenge as an organization was to motivate people to leave their usual comfort zone, routine work, to come and do COVID work. I'll pause here. Look, look, thanks for that reflection. I, I just am struck there, you know, by that decision that you made to have the leaders to go back right into that clinical front line. Um, and how, what were you thinking at that time yourself when you, when you made that decision to, to take on that role? I spoke with my family and I said, are you comfortable with this? Because there was apprehension, even though all the four of us are in the medical field. They said, please go ahead. We will pray that the Lord will protect you. And so I think going to the forefront to, to be in the thick of things, also being the initial ones to take the vaccine, there was huge vaccine hesitancy in the institution. And all the administrators lined up on the first two days and took the vaccine and we publicized it. We also met department from department to department to say, please take the vaccine. And 90% took the vaccine and we're reaping the benefits now. Mm -hmm. By God's grace, till last week, we had not lost a single worker, but last week we lost our first healthcare worker to COVID out of 10,500. And he was an individual who refused to take the vaccine. Mm. That, that's a really telling statistic there, JVP. And I, I understand that the, the vaccination rates amongst your staff is very high, above 95%, is that, um, which is just so inspiring for us here. Um, we do have vaccine hesitancy here in Australia really very significantly and even within our healthcare workers. So um, there's a lot we can learn, learn from you there. I think that's great. Um, Jubin, I'll turn to you now and just you've been working in, in psychology uh, throughout this time. Can you tell us a bit about what you've been doing? Um, thank you. And... Um... I think mostly what we've been doing, so I'm, a, I'm part of a team that's working together with uh, the medical team to be in the wards with the patients. And I think the main thing we've been doing is basically accompanying those who are sick and in the wards and their families, because mostly all illnesses in India is a community experience. You know, you have family members visiting, food comes from home. There's one person who cares for you at the hospital. But all of this, that has been taken away with the way this disease is. And to provide that kind of support or that kind of uh, presence, to be that kind of presence with the patients who are in the wards and their families and sort of connect them, even though they can't be together, but be the sort of voice between the family and the person who's sick um, 
is the sort of role that we've been playing. And what what different, how has your role altered because of the COVID infection compared with what you would normally do? Has there been any changes that you've had to make? Uh, Yes, maybe I can tell you one story of a gentleman who's in the ward at the moment with us now. He's uh, on the elderly side and every time we walk up to him, so we're in our PPE, right? So every time we walk up to him, he just gets scared and moves away because he can't understand why we are dressed the way we are. And all he can see of us is our eyes, right? And so every time we walk up to him, he just, you know, startles and moves away from us before we, before he, you know, he hears our voice and then responds to us. So it's as simple as that. People can't see us. Mm. We relate to each other through our, you know, expressions, through the facial expressions and um, our elderly, so like when we serve our elderly, they like to bless us or touch our face or hold our hands and they can hold our hands, but they can't really hold our hands, hands, you know, so mm. uh, they can, they, the, the distance has been created because of all of that as well. And that makes it harder or when we have children come in or those with disabilities or with intellectual disabilities come in all of those relationships, the way we would have navigated those relationships have changed because of the way the disease is. Mm -hmm. So I might just ask you to expand a little bit more about the experiences of caring for people with disability during this time and how maybe some of the challenges that that's presented. Sure. So um, when some of our experiences has been when someone with a disability has come in, Uh, especially someone with, say, an intellectual disability or someone who's on the autistic spectrum. And then we ask them to uh, isolate themselves or to be away from their family so that we can become their primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. uh, Totally shakes them up. I mean, we've had to have uh, disability rights activists intervene in some cases, asking that the person with disability can have their family member be with them you know, move to a private room, have a family member be with them. So those were not considerations we had had and we had not put systems in place initially for those things at all. And uh, so that's been one. The other is another uh, situation in our hospital at the moment. We have parents who are COVID positive and admitted in the hospital. So their children are by themselves at home. And so there's a child with disability at home and uh, they're from Nepal, so they don't have any other extended family to care for them. So Mm -hmm. immediately then we have to put up systems where our staff are visiting the children at home, ensuring they have food, et cetera. So we had not thought of those things or those implications when, well, we had become a COVID hospital and put systems in place for care, you know? So those are some examples, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jivan. So perhaps maybe back to you, JVP, I wonder, um, you know, you've had a long career, distinguished career in, in, in medicine and, and healthcare. Um, what do you think prepared you to, for this moment to respond to the COVID pandemic as a leader of CMC? Uh, nothing, uh, you know, prepares you for something as uh, uh, severe as this. But uh, I just want to go back to a very strong biblical principle Moses was prepared in the palace before he learned, where he learned how to lead. And I believe over the years, I think God has prepared me for this period of leadership. I think the key preparation was in Australia because I spent nearly eight years in Adelaide training in intensive care. And I'm amazed at uh, that training because uh, never did I imagine that the institution had a, would have a core focus on critical care and disaster management, which are integral to training. We are also so blessed that we have three more intensivists who are trained from Australia who are part of our team, who coordinated this whole disaster management plan and uh, uh, ramping up intensive care beds. Now we are used to say 20, 30 intensive care bedded units in uh, Australia. And we are presently running 105 intensive care beds in CMC, and that was not enough. So we have converted five wards as semi-intensive care units where we provide non-invasive ventilation. There are another 150 patients on non-invasive ventilation. It's mind boggling, but the number of intensivists are only about 10 or 12. So a lot of training upskilling had to happen. So to summarize, yes, a lot of learnings through the years, 
prepared for a time prepared us for a time like this I, I can imagine that it's starting to take it, its toll on the workforce, on everybody, just the, the amount of time, the effort, the long hours, the difficulty in working, as you say, within PPE. So, Jimin, I wonder if you could comment on how, um, you know, the workforce is looking after mental health needs of, of, them, of themselves. I would like to say that we have a system in place and things are going well, but I think at this point we are just surviving. We uh, like we had started the conversation, our numbers are beginning to plateau. So I think we are beginning to breathe now because earlier it was just purely go day by day, just keep going in there and doing what we can. Um, we have been talking about debriefing with our uh, staff and with, you know, with everybody who's involved. But uh, so hospitals like ours are really small. So everyone has already pitched in. So there is nobody to pull back and look at uh, the circumstance and go into debriefing. So we may have to wait a little longer before we get there. Um, there is the physical exhaustion, yes, but also the, um, I think the term is compassion fatigue. That's also beginning to set in with uh, the number of people we've, gotten to know well as they're in the wards with us and as they have become sick and the uh, relationships with the families and helping the families grieve. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's been a pro, so it's, it's not just about the medical care or about uh, losing a patient, quote unquote, but it's about everything else surrounding it as well, both for our own sakes, because we are grieving because we got to know the person well and supporting families as they are grieving. So I don't know that we have things in place yet to look at that particularly. So other than ensuring people get some time off work, unless our staff have fallen sick. Uh, mm. <laughs> uh, at the moment, we are on that survival mode to get over the peak. Mm. Yes, I, I, I can imagine uh, that it, it's a very challenging time. JVP, what, what do you think could be done for, for the workforce, for the students? Sounds like there's still a good sense of morale um, within, within the workforce, but it, it must be taking its toll. What, what things do you think could be done at this time? I think uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, an entire team of people are working towards staff welfare, uh, right from psychologists uh, getting into the wards, psychiatrists being available, online uh, programs, uh, chaplaincy department reaching out. So we have had different teams where we have said each neighbor looks out for their own peer group. So we've created small groups where they uh, get encouraged from each other and that has helped we are also, I mean, this is not the norm in India. We have tried to provide them snacks and uh, uh, once a week, we give them a recognition meal. Uh, many things, we give them updates every week uh, uh, through an online platform. So several strategies have been put in place to encourage them. But as uh, Jubin says, there is exhaustion. There mm -hmm. is definitely exhaustion. And we are trying to pick out those people who are, you know, on the verge of those uh, issues and uh, attend to them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Jibin, I know that you did the Sister Mary Glowry program. Um, I wonder if reflecting on that time, you wouldn't have imagined this was going to, to present it, COVID would present itself, but are there things that, that you would think back about the program that have been useful for this time? Um. I must confess, when Dr. JVP was talking earlier, I doubt anything we have uh, trained in prepares us for the level of suffering we have seen particularly. But I think uh, one of the things from the uh, Mary Glory uh, time would have been, I think, okay, two things. One was, uh, that's when we had started talking about disability inclusive uh, disaster responses. So uh, the conversations around that and the thinking around that was one of those things that uh, has sort of stood with us as we looked at our programs here now as uh, in responding to COVID. And I guess the other thing was all the relationships that we formed at that point in time. So uh, 
so a lot of people who have reached out to support us and i mean people from the university of melbourne uh, but uh, friends across who have reached out to support us to um I mean, to send in an encouraging word to us when we are in the middle of it has been, um, yeah, quite amazing. So, yes, I think those two would be the main aspect. Yeah, thanks. I know we have much to learn from the experience that you have all been going through and still are going through. Um, and we can, we just, it's inspiring to see the way in which our healthcare colleagues have responded to this challenge. Uh, it, it truly is because uh, we can only imagine how difficult that it has been for you. Um, and I know that we send our wishes that this, um, you know, is able to be contained um, and that you're able to move forward into more normal times as soon as possible, in which, and when the time comes where you can all have a rest, a well-deserved rest, and perhaps even some travel abroad, we would love to welcome you to Melbourne. So it's been a, a great pleasure to be able to speak with you this afternoon, um, and I will turn to Nathan um, to finish up the, the program for today. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and thank you for those kind words and for sharing today. And just to thank you, yeah, JVP and Jubin. Uh, I know you've had busy days to get back to now, and we appreciate you taking some time to, to speak with us and share your experiences and, and hopefully inform how we can support you and be alongside uh, you. I know you know that you are in our, our hearts and prayers and have been for the last few months. So on, this is an Australian Indian Institute uh, podcast. It'll be jointly produced with the medical faculty and the Global Health Alliance uh, will also be promoting the podcast. So on behalf of all, all three partners, we just want to thank you for the time and we look forward to staying in touch.